Okay, I think we're going to try to get started if everyone could uh, find a seat. This is the first of two sessions today in honor of Jim Collins. Um, first of all, some clarification, he's not retiring. And and secondly, he's alive. He's sitting right here. So uh, those were two things we wanted to, to make sure that everyone knew. Um, Jim doesn't need much introduction. All of us have read his work. His most recent, Le, uh, Le Monarchie Républicain, was published after his Collège de France lectures in, in 2016. His date in early modern France, <coughs> excuse me, the ancient regime from France to uh, the revolution, classes in estates, and of course the fiscal of, its, of absolutism. So today we're going to have a panel, an ambitious panel, that everyone's going to try to stick to 10 minutes. So I'll do very brief introductions and then we'll let everybody um, give their presentation. So this is the session of Culture, Society, Gender, and the State in Early Modern Europe. Um, and I'm the session chair, Sarah Chapman Williams. I um, was a gym student and I'm now at Oakland University in uh, Michigan. So the first speaker we have is Karen Taylor. She's a gym student from Georgetown. I'm not going to give the dates of the PhDs just to make everyone feel more comfortable, including me. Um, but she, her, her talk is a geography of knowledge, St. Sears Cahier de Geographie, and she's currently director of education in, in the Institute for Learning um, and Teaching at the Ecole Internationale de Genève. So Karen. And I think I've already lost something here. Um, hold on. How's that? Okay. Well, good morning. It's really, really a pleasure to be here and, and an honor. And so now I'm going to talk just briefly. I'm going to stick to my time. I've timed myself. Um, about these uh, manuals that were used to teach geography at Saint-Cyr in the 18th century. <coughs> and I was recently talking with some secondary school geography teachers who are using virtual reality headsets to explore urban planning with their students. And then I was talking with some upper primary teachers who are planning a project using an image projected from above onto kinetic sand for their students to work on topography and ge geological change over time. So given the sophistication of technology and teaching today, you might wonder why I'm still so excited about <laughs> some cloth covered manuals that were used to teach geography. But the thing I find so interesting really in life generally is its simplicity. And the, in essence, these sources serve absolutely the same purpose as the virtual reality headsets, um, although not of the same kind of advanced technology. Because the pedagogical aim is for students to make sense of the world and their place in it, whether they are high school students in 21st century Geneva or the Demoiselle at Saint-Cyr. So I want to think just for a second about how you might even define geography, um, the concept of geography. Are you talking about physical geography or political geography or cultural geography? So you could be making reference to the location of entities in physical space, or you could be looking at the location of ideas in conceptual space. And that's really what I'm trying to do here. And there are implications, of course, in terms of knowledge and power and gender and opportunity. Now, the value of geography in the early modern period was traditionally associated with male spheres of knowledge. In the preface of his Introduction à la Géographie, 1682, so end, end of 17th century, Nicolas Sanson argued, il n'y a aucun emploi dans la vie civile où cette science ne soit nécessaire. So for Sanson and his contemporaries, uh, familiarity with geography was necessary for rulers, for royal officials, for magistrates, for clergy, for men of finance, but above all for men. But by the 18th century, authors were beginning to suggest that geography is a subject that's easily understood by both men and women. And we know now that Saint-Cyr was not the only institution, um, nor the only one for girls, that offered 
some form of geography in, as a part of its curriculum. But what did the curriculum consist of? That still remains fairly vague, except in the case of Saint-Cyr, we have something really fortunate. In the discovery in 1990 of a box in the cellar of Versailles, um, of these 230 folders and some 20 larger maps, wall maps, that were subsequently identified as curricular material from the school. So as you can see here um, on the cover of the folders, they're covered with this you know, cloth that varies. It's not always this particular design. Um, and, they, and they have a little number indicating the general order of lessons. The overall content and structure of the cahier resembles um, standard geographical texts of the period, like Nicolas de Fer's Atlas Royal, à l'usage de Monseigneur le Duc de Bourgogne. Now, I could list others, but time is short. And um, this text that I just mentioned is particularly important to my story. The maps are, for the most part, um, from 1719 by Jacques Chiquet, with the exception of the maps of North America. Um, these were all done in 1750 by Robert de Vogondi. And it's interesting because then we see, of course, that the curriculum has evolved over the course of the 18th century. And then what you see here is the text that accompanies a map. So it's the same structure for all of the cahier. And as noted above, or just a moment ago, uh, Nicolas de Fer's Alas Royale was produced for the Dauphin. And there are other connections between the geography curriculum at Saint-Cyr and the education of the presumed heir to the French throne. And we see this because the texts from the cahier that accompany the maps are in certain passages repeating word for word the intendant's reports that were drawn up at the request of the Duc de Beauvilliers and Fénelon for the education of the Duc de Bourgogne. So we see, again, a challenge to this assumption that geography belonged to a male, male sphere of knowledge. And the fact that the demoiselles were introduced to the same content in their studies as that presumed heir to the throne, I think is fairly significant. Um, there's not time here to go into the links um, to concepts of state building and the role of Louis XIV and others in envisaging a, uh, well, a new sort of role for the noblesse d'épée in this process, but it is important. What I actually would like to focus on today is um, a link I see, and I hope you will be convinced, between the content of the cahier, the structure really, and 18th century epistemology. So most of the cahier also have uh, an accompanying sort of loose leaf sheet that's copied out in a different hand, like the one you see here. And it, they, have, they vary a bit, of course, but um, there's always this uh, few lines listing major cities, regions, topographical points of interest, etc. And then the specific points on the lists are dealt with in greater detail in the accompanying text. Now I'm imagining, as a teacher, that these were the kinds of things you might memorize. Um, so if you look at the structure, you say, okay, this little demoiselle opens up her cahier. The first thing she sees is the map. Then she sees this list of identifications that she can then locate on the map. And then she can become more familiar with the region by delving a bit into the accompanying text. OK, but how do you link that to a broader intellectual context? Um, in his lectures on physical geography, Immanuel Kant argued that geography and history are inherently connected because they both deal with space and time. And then, even more, geography is one of the principal foundations of natural science. Now, for Kant, the individual engaged in the study of geography or history and in doing so formed a mental map in order to process information derived from the printed word. 
and that is, of course, you know, necessarily consisting of abstract concepts. And the very combination of map and text in the Cahiers requires the use of imagination, which for Kant was but one element in the process of assimilating knowledge about the world, and one that is necessary to spatial perception. Although he did not use the same term mental map, Descartes too believed that the knowledge of the external world is assimilated by the production of a mental image. Think of Locke, an essay concerning human understanding, 1690. And Locke, like so many others, was asserting that sense experience is the source of operations of the mind as well as our ideas. And he, of course, had a tremendous influence in, in France. You can think of Condillac and his Traité des Sensations, so 1754, in which he concludes that the development of memory and imagination leads the individual to make comparisons and judgments which give birth to new ideas. Condillac's thought experiment in which he imagined a statue evolving from a state of pure consciousness to an understanding of space, form, and its own relationship to the outside world is useful when you consider the way in which the Dumoiselle was supposed to assimilate information from the Cahier. And Condillac's theory is maybe most easily understood if, if I put it in a little diagram. Um, so pure consciousness which expands into an awareness of perception which involves the use of memory and then other faculties of the mind. And for Condillac, memory also produced a series of related ideas. Une suite d'idées qui forme une espèce de chaîne. So I'll let you read this little quote. The very structure of the cahiers, with their combination of map, accompanying text, and list of terms, echoes precisely this mental process whereby a visual image should ideally lead to the exercise of memory, and finally faculties of the mind such as comparison and judgment, as the demoiselle reflected upon the material within multiple cahiers. For Condillac, language gives humankind freedom. For, quote, once man has invented signs to stand for ideas, he can become an active thinker capable of initiating a chain of ideas, end quote. Such an assertion may have held even greater significance for women than men as they were assumed to be by their very nature, guided by emotion rather than reason. If we accept the idea that the cahiers reflect 18th century philosophical and epistemological movements, then we can draw two general but related conclusions from them. First, the demoiselles were exposed to subject matter that was traditionally associated with a male and a political sphere of knowledge. Second, the implicit presupposition of the use of imagination and reason rests on a similarly implicit belief that women possess the same capacity for reason as do men, and that they too were independent agents capable of acting on the world. Now, like this Madame Mademoiselle Ferrand, uh, in a painting by Quentin de Latour, um, meditating on Newton, the, the, the demoiselle may have gone on to read Madame du Châtelet's Newton. At the very least, the school's geography lessons and other parts of the curriculum opened the way for their entrance into contemporary intellectual and cultural life. And so I'll conclude with the last image of our little demoiselle. Um, this is Louis Marchand's Livre d'écriture italienne pour les demoiselles, la maison de Saint-Louis établie à Saint-Cyr. Despite much debate, over the nature and capacities of women, women have, did become rather, increasingly active in cultural and intellectual space over the course of the 18th century. And this was a public space, and therefore one traditionally deemed male, as opposed to the private sphere of the domestic and domesticated female. And yet it is precisely the education that young women received at school, 
an education that was permeated by enlightenment thought and its emphasis on reason and judgment that opened the way for women's increasing participation in that public sphere. Thank you.